We have a very strong global presence with Polarian and partner offices located in strategic markets around the world. Our principal offices are located in Germany, the United States, France, the United Kingdom, the Czech Republic, and Switzerland. Polarian provides many benefits and uh, different products. Here are a few of the things that we'll find today. First of all, it's easy to use. It's very simple. It works very much like Microsoft Office, but has none of the limitations or shortcomings that Office has if you're trying to use Word or Excel for requirements management. This familiarity will shorten the learning curve considerably and make it much more comfortable. We provide a guaranteed traceability with forensic level links providing accountability throughout the system. This is excellent, an excellent approach when you need to set up managerial or regulatory audit type reports. We can support any type of process or methodology for organizations of any size in any industry using any process. You can actually map your processes, your existing processes, to our product. So rather than having to meet the requirements of our product, we will meet your process requirements. Today's agenda is pretty inclusive. Uh, today we're going to talk about the requirements management aspects of Polarian. There are some common pains experienced when you're growing a requirements system from scratch, or if you've been using Microsoft Office or Word for doing and handling your, your various requirements. Uh, we'll review some of these issues and provide an alternative approach to resolving them. Lastly, as uh, Nancy mentioned, we're going to finish up with a short Q&A session for anything that's outstanding. So let's give it a let's give it a go here. Let's get started. So many questions about requirements. What is a requirement? Where do requirements reside? Where do they come from? What types of requirements do I have? What types do I need? How are they organized in my internal documents now? Everybody has requirements. How they're handling them varies from shop to shop. All excellent questions. You may be using Microsoft Word or Excel to manage your requirements, and this practice may have become rather unwieldy. Uh, you might have a variety of requirements, such as system requirements or functional requirements or software or mechanical. This list gets rather lengthy, unfortunately. What kind of requirement you have is determined by what is defined. You may have a high-level requirement that is refined, if you will, or defined, further subdefined, by lower-level requirements. So you have that you need to be able to set up that relationship. You may also have multiple requirements within a paragraph, if you're using Word, for example. A lot of our customers write requirements in a paragraph form. In the example you see on the screen, the first paragraph encompasses several ideas that can equate to different requirements. Requirements can come from a section in a document, perhaps a summary, or even a glossary. We often find that there may be one or more sections in a document devoted specifically to requirements, and this is the only place where they appear in the document. The bottom line is you may have requirements anywhere, coming from anywhere in any document in your system. There are several ways to get requirements into Polarian. We're going to talk about several of them now. First, if you're using Microsoft Word or Excel, Polarian allows you to easily import all your existing documents into a managed content, uh, I'm sorry, into managed content and, and uh, artifacts. Requirements in paragraphs or sections can be identified and separated during the import. When the import is complete, you will have a document or container that will hold the requirements in an organized fashion. Now, let's just take an aside here just for a moment. Uh, this, this document that you're going to see, uh, the document will look very similar to Word, but it's not, uh, Polarian does not operate at a document level. We operate at the artifact level. So you're, all the different artifacts, all the different requirements in a Polarian document are individual and they're managed individually, they're accessed individually. So this is a big variation from the Word environment where Word tends to work at a document level. If you're creating or editing requirements manually, which we'll see this here in just a minute, Polarian provides a very nice editing environment that will let you create a document and its associated requirements or editing existing requirements in place. When you create a requirement, that requirement may be on a single line, like the short sentence, or it may be longer, but the goal is to break down a longer multi-topic paragraph into smaller individual requirements wherever possible. Regardless of how you get requirements into the system, they should be treated as individual entities, not as an entire document. Also, when you save your work, the requirements should be numbered uniquely so that a requirement has this identification throughout its life cycle. No other requirement will have that unique number. That lets us reference this unique item 
anywhere it goes in the system, including traceability tables, which we'll discuss a little bit later. If you're still using Word or Excel, you've probably found that creating uh, unique numbers is very difficult within those systems, is very difficult to create, very difficult to manage. This may be something that, uh, that you're looking for at this point. Let's go ahead and look at importing a manual document preparation real quick, just to get an idea of where these requirements can come from. What I have here is uh, what we call the eLibrary product definition. It is a user specification. Looks a lot like Word. It has a title, it has a table of contents, it has headings, sections, scope, overall description. Uh, here's uh, where we're going to vary a little bit down in the list here. Uh, unlike in Word, this is a requirement. It has a unique number, EL105. It can have graphics, it can have text. And as we go down through this document, we see we have many more requirements. Okay, let's take a look just briefly at how this may have gotten into the system. What I'm going to do is go to the specification page. Well, the system just logged me in, so bear with me just a moment. And there's an import button here, a big green button that says import documents. A uh, very simple process to import, but very powerful. If I click on import, it's going to get, want to know if I have a configuration pre-described. I'm going to run the default. And it wants to know what document I want to move in. So let's look at the eLibrary 2012 specification document and say open. Next. So what Polarin is going to do is it's going to chop up that Word document and design it based on this set of rules over here on the right. As you can see, it looks very similar to what we just looked at. It's going to cut up everything based on the idea of finding words, uh, must and should. So where I find a must, it's creating a requirement. There's another must, a uh, must. Now there's a should down in here somewhere, I'm sure. So that's one way to get information into the system if you're using Word now. We can also do this with Excel. The rules, very complete, very extensive, gives you a lot of flexibility in the system. Second way to get into the system is uh, through manual process. Let's go ahead and look at something that I've already imported. So I created a document very easily, and all I did was copy and paste a bunch of information in here from a Word document, just to give you an idea of the abilities that we have for creating documents and creating the, uh, the requirements in a document. So right now, it's all just plain text. All I did was uh, sit down and start typing the information that I needed. I'm going to go through this just real quick and uh, give this a heading. I'm going to give it another heading here. You have a variety of different sizes and fonts that you can use. When we get to requirements, this will be my last uh, last heading in the document. But when I click on the requirement one line, you can notice up here on the top where I have an icon that tells me that this is a this is a requirement. All I have to really do is click on this, and it will identify that as a requirement. Very simple process. Now, how did we get those those numbers, those unique numbers? Right now I have four, five, and six. These are temporary folders. When I save the document, it will identify the idea that these are unique numbers. There's the EL numbers popping up. We also have the ability to change things. Like here's a requirement three and four in the same area, and that was actually a mistake. So I just hit enter, uh, save it, and make another requirement. So there's two ways that you can actually get information into the system very easily. You start from scratch. You can import Word documents or Excel spreadsheets, and we can go for there. When a requirement is being managed in Polarian, many questions can easily be answered. For example, what is the current status of my requirement? Are my requirements ready for approval? What priority does my requirement have, and who may have approved it? Once a requirement is brought under Polarian management, all these questions and many more can be answered by reviewing the requirement itself or by including it in a variety of queries or reports within the system. Now, what about the words? The words that we use to identify a requirement, words like must or shall or should. Can the words be used to mean something else in the system or are they just there to identify and make a requirement read easier for an end user? Well, they actually have definition, if you will. They definitely make it easier to define the requirement as well as imply a severity level. For example, must might be absolutely required or should may be optional. If you're using tables, how can you find what you need or separate re requirements? It can be done, but it's more difficult. Uh, finally, what if you don't want to have to, uh, to deal with an entire document on an approval basis and you would rather go ahead and improve individual requirements? 
very difficult to do in Word, but rather simple in a Flarian because each requirement has its own workflow and its own approval process. This means every requirement can be at a different stage in its life cycle, where one requirement might be in a draft status, another requirement could be approved and ready to go. When you are defining a requirement, you should define specific values for specific fields. Ambiguity should be kept to a minimum. Ideally, it should be eliminated. Using words like must or shall or will denote a specific need for a requirement. Words like might or could leave too much room for mis misinterpret the intent. So we need to be more specific. We have customers who have moved away from using Word or Excel and are putting the requirement information in, I'm sorry, they haven't moved away from Excel, they've moved from Word to Excel and they're putting their information for requirements there. This is actually a step in the right direction, primarily because Excel acts like a repository. It is limited compared to other repositories, but nonetheless, you have the ability to sort the information and to do some limited searches to find the requirements that you may be interested in. When a requirement is brought under Polarian control, it is created along with any number of properties or fields that further define or enhance the requirement. For example, a requirement may have a priority field or a series of fields that identify start dates or end dates, estimated hours to complete the item, and many others. Each requirement is also assigned a status field. The status represents a very powerful workflow engine in the background. The workflow will determine where the requirement life, where in the requirements lifecycle the current requirement is and where it can go from there. In addition, the workflow engine can identify required fields and limit functionality to specific roles in the system. All this information is stored in an underlying repository, making it much simpler and easier to search and report on any of the information that we're managing. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. Here we have, in, actually, let's go to a different document. Okay. All right, so here we have one, uh, EL 105, this requirement. I'm going to look at the requirement itself by clicking on the icon and saying open item. This is the requirement. It's going to have the format. It's got a heading on the top. It gives me some relationship information. In fact, this is the first step of, of traceability. You can see that EL5 has these children. It's connected to all of these different work items uh, underneath. But we have requirements, et cetera, all the different fields that we talked about, time, time points, due dates, target releases, and the status. Uh, as I mentioned, the status is very, very important in a sense that it tells you where you are approved and where you can go from here. I can accept or reject this. There may be 20 different steps in my process, but the, the system will manage where you can go based on where you are. So all this information can be added, it can be customized, it can be changed. If we go back to the document, we can see that this information is also available in a panel on the right side called Work Item Properties. We can see the severity with status approved. We talked about having information be specific to, as opposed to ambiguous. So from approved, we can accept or reject. Uh, severity is uh, must have, should have, nice to have, will not have. Very specific items, not, not generalizations. What happens when you have other, another project, but specifications are very similar to the current project? This is a question that's asked by a lot of our customers who are governed, especially those governed by regulatory agencies such as DOD or FDA, or companies that are building multiple versions of an item, like say, for example, a router, but it has minor differences between different levels, or revision, not revisions, but different models of routers. The basis of it is the same. So you might have a project for a router that has 100 items in it, and of those 100 items, maybe 50 or 60 or 70 percent of those will transfer to other projects, uh, other models. So can you do that? How can you reuse existing project information? Uh, how can you save time and effort? And if we can do this, how do you keep variance in sync with the main line of development? This is kind of interesting in a sense that you can do this in Flare and you can do it very simply. There's a couple ways. You can do what's called reuse a document and we'll show that in just a minute. This gives you a complete copy of a document along with all of its requirements. So it's, it's like a save as and change the name, you know, it just goes different, uh, but it's all the same document. Yeah. This approach allows you to centralize requirements or share them in a different, different project. This works across projects as well as within a project. You can also do what we call branching ball. Again, this functionality goes across projects. The approach allows you to create and manage variants for projects of similar design and minor verification, or valid, I'm sorry, minor variations within the project. This is the idea of the router, is where something is very similar, but enough different that it requires its own development route. 
So these two approaches have, the, have some differences, and they can be applied in different situations. Using Polarian, you can define a central library where standardized documents can be hosted. From here, you can reuse a document in any project or use it as many times as you need to. So it's like having a master, and you just pop up a template, fill it out in the new project or the new, the new space, the new area in the project that you're working in. You can use copy and paste to move requirements from one project to another, but this is a little bit time consuming and there are some caveats. First, you need to re review the source requirement to make sure that the target project can support the requirements, uh, structure and fields. And when using variants, uh, you must decide whether to allow a system to update the new requirement from its source or freeze the new requirement as it is in its current revision. Let's get an idea of how this is actually working. If I am going to work with a document such as this and I want to share it, there's a couple things I can do. We talked about reuse and branch. I'm going to expand on this concept just a little bit. We're going to come back and use uh, this example here in just a moment. But we can filter this. What if I don't want all of the different requirements in this document to be part of the new document? I can do it. I can simply say, use this document. It will ask for a name and tell me or ask me where I want it, uh, what project I want it in, what space I want it in. So it gives me some options. But what if I don't want everything? What if I don't want the must-haves? I just want the should-haves. So we can, we can actually go ahead and filter this so that when I filter it, I can say, just tell me the uh, severity should-have. That's all I want to see. So now when I scroll down through this document, I have a little notice up here that says a filter is applied. Some work items can be hidden, and this would be true. All my severities now will be should-haves. There are no must-haves, there are no will-haves, nothing. So I can actually filter the document before I send it off, before I reuse it or, or uh, branch it, and then I will only get a subset of the original document. So I have a lot of, uh, lot of capability there. Let me go ahead and close this filter. Now, when I reuse a document, as I said earlier, I will get everything in the document that I want, and it will take all of the requirements that I keep, you know, if I'm using a filter, all the, all the ones I keep, but it will give them all new IDs. So you will basically making, be making new requirements in a reuse situation. Let's kind of do a, uh, a branch situation. The branch is a little different in the sense that I can, uh, when I branch this, I can give it a name, I can tell it a project and a space, just like reuse. But what happens is I don't get a new copy of the requirement. Instead of having a solid line down the left side, I'll get a dotted line very similar to this table of contents. And that tells me that it's frozen. I'm sorry, that it's uh, referenced in. If it's a solid line, this, this piece is actually here. So if it's referenced in, I can change the original document and all of the branched versions will change unless I've stopped that. That's unlike the reuse, where the reuse ends up creating a, a brand new copy, and it's, it's not actually, well, it can be, but it's not generally linked back to the original. So that gives you a lot of easy flexibility to be able to manage that environment. In a Polarian environment, it's almost impossible to experience a conflict. People ask us all the time, well, what happens if somebody works on the same thing I work on? And in my experience with Polarian thus far, that rarely happens. And the reason being is because when you're working in Polarian, you're not working on a document like you are in Word. You're working on an individual item inside of this document container. All right. So as you know, the document contains many, many numbers of requirements. You can have five, you can have 10, you can have 500. Uh, so when a team is working on a document, generally speaking, each person is working on a different or a separate requirement. So this creates an environment where conflicts do not generally occur. However, should a conflict arise, Polarian will notify you and ask you what you'd like to do with this. Now remember, all the changes to a document or a requirement are being recorded. So because of this, Polarian can show the history of any artifact in the system and present what changes were made, who made them, and when they were made. Now, reports can be generated to satisfy any management or regulatory audits. Capturing history, uh, there's, there's a variation here. When you're using Word and you're using the track changes in Word, the document starts out pretty simple, but over time, you may end up with a large number of changes, additions, deletions, et cetera, that soon, become, soon becomes hard to see and hard to find what we're looking for. The answer here is to create a new revision. Unfortunately, when you do that, 
you lose the reference to all the prior changes and you start fresh, so to speak. Because you're working at a document level, there is no referencing to the changes made to specific individual requirements, nor is it a simple matter to see when a change occurred or who made it. This actually becomes one of the many reasons people come to Polarian. They want to track changes at an atomic level. They want to be able to go back to the beginning of the work item or the requirement or the document and see who has done what and when it was done. What about the project level? That was the uh, work item level or the requirement level. What about at the project level? Polarian can pro provide that type of information at the pro project level or that as well. Excuse me just a minute. I'm sorry. We do this by using a feature that we call baselining. Now, baseline takes a snapshot of the system the way it is. Uh, just anytime you want, you can take a baseline. We'll see that in just a moment. And it, it just freezes. The whole project takes a picture of it. You can go back to that picture anytime you need to. We can also go back in time, uh, not just by saying, okay, well, last week we did this, we did this, uh, this baseline. Let's go back and see what that was. It's not really what I'm talking about. We have this thing called, uh, we call it a time machine. You can actually go back in time through all the revisions of, of a project, all the revisions of an item, and say, okay, on this date or at this revision level, I want to shoot a baseline. Calarian will let you achieve that. We can, uh, we can do that. So let's see how that baselining actually works. Okay. So in order to do a baseline, we come down to the bottom here and expand our tool set to baselines. All we have to do is say, create a baseline, give it a name, tell it what revision we want to base this on. If we know a revision, we can pick it from the list, or we can keep it just at the head revision, which is the first one, and uh, give it a description. When I say finish, that baseline has been shot. It's done, okay? A very simple process to create a baseline. Let's get an idea here of what it looks like the history, actually, before we do, let's look at this. We can compare two baselines. We can uh, show the report. Let's say compare. Oops. Let's uh, pick two. Cancel. We'll take the uh, head version and the one back here and compare them. <clears throat> we can generate a report that's uh, rather lengthy. It takes a few minutes, so we won't do it today. But it will show me all the differences between the two versions of the baseline. So we're basically seeing what's changed in the project. We can do that. We can also... <coughs> Uh, look at the history of work items. Let's go ahead and look at this work item as an individual piece. Everywhere in the project, or everywhere, all the different work items that you see, if you notice a clock button, this is the history button. When we click on this, we are going to get a picture of this work item since its inception, all the changes that were made to it, who made them, and when the changes were done. Let's go ahead and refresh the screen. You know, a little bit of... Uh, Network issues here. There we go. Well, while that does that, we'll come back to that. We'll look at the document level, and then we'll come back to the item level. This is the document, and uh, we're going to go ahead and discard any changes we have. Here are the revisions of the document. I can look at the current revision. I can compare it to the original. And when I do the compare, I'm going to get a, a comparison similar in nature to Word for Windows, something that you may be familiar with. You see what's changed, all the different aspects, what's been added, what's been deleted, uh, how things have changed. So the history of a document is supported as well as the, let's see how we got going over here, the history of the work item. <clears throat> I can see that on this date, 2014, 520, so May 20th, that uh, my friend Mr. Merrill went ahead and changed this. What did he do? He didn't remove anything, but he added information to this thought or to this work item. As we go down through here, we can see that Andy, another colleague, has been very busy. David's been busy. <clears throat> and we can go all the way down to the bottom of the list. And this is when it was created. It was done by the system administrator on March 13th, 2013. And now we can track this and trace this the whole way up through its life, its life expectancy, its entire life cycle, all the way up to today. So all the changes can be seen at any time that you need them. Traceability. <clears throat> Establishing traceability. Uh, traceability has become more of a requirement today than, than an option in today's environment. How can you easily see if a requirement has the supporting information it needs? How can you easily navigate to the correct location and add refining or testing information 
as required to support your requirements. Well, remember when using Polarian, each artifact in Polarian receives a unique identification number. So when Polarian artifacts are used, like for example, test cases and requirements, it creates a, a very secure, uh, very solid method of building traceability. And it's done at the granular level. So instead of using a spreadsheet where you're, you're tra doing traceability in a table and if something changes, it's all wrong, uh, using Polarian keeps everything kind of above board. So let's take a look here at a traceability table, something like this. So the first step to achieve the, the answer to the questions of how can I tell if my requirements are covered? In other words, do I have the appropriate supporting documents, or not documents, but the supporting work items to, uh, to make sure my requirement is appropriate? Or how do I know the artifacts supporting my requirement are attached and they're complete? So a report like this that actually shows you in the first column, oh, sorry, the first column, uh, is a listing of requirements. Second column is a listing of test cases that support the associated requirements. Third column in this particular example is a, uh, a listing of the results of running the test. If it says no test, the test wasn't run. So it'll, be show, it'll show pass or fail. So let's kind of look at this. The third item down on this table, uh, second, second column is empty. That means that there is no test requirement for the or test case for that test requirement. So how do you fix that? Well, let's look at a requirements table. This is similar. This is an excerpt, if you will, from the very similar to what we just saw. We're going to use EL105 again. It currently has three test cases assigned to it. Uh, one failed, one passed, one failed. But what if we go down through here? Oh, there's one right there. Oh, it's closed, so we don't need that one. This one's open. Let's look at EL165. It has no test case assigned to it. So you see this report. How do you actually add a test case? First, you determine whether you need a test case. How do you get there? Let's click on EL165. This will take me to that requirement. I can look at it. I can read the description. I can see if there's any other information in here. And I can say, yes, I need a test case. I want to click here and say, uh, create a verifying test case <coughs> and give it a title. I'm going to let this go for now for time's, uh, time's sake. And say, re uh, fill it out the way I want it and then say create. All right, so it's going to create this. It gave it a number, EL3018. Well, we can also see that it's been linked back automatically to EL165, which is that requirement. If I look at the requirement now, it has a child test case. But equally important, if I come back here, EL165 is still blank. But let me go ahead and refresh my screen here. And this table will be uh, updated in real time. It's running the query now. There we go. Let's go down to 165, and we will see that EL3018 is now part of our of our traceability. This type of table, very important to a lot of our customers. This example shows requirements, test cases, and results. It can show anything that we want, any relationship that you have that you're, that you're trying to create traceability for. So let's review what we've done here. Uh, we've covered five areas in which we can make managing requirements easier and more effective in your shop. We created some documents, both manual and imported, designed around the idea of making individual artifacts uh, individual requirements rather than working with a full document. Uh, we set up some requirement properties and looked at a workflow where we could go, what we could do, see priorities and severity and statuses, and, and identified what they can do for us. We used the reuse and branch facilities in the system so that we could share uh, standardized forms or requirements, uh, or we could branch into a multiple development line environment and still manage that information so that you're not spending all day, if something changes in the main line, not spending all day going back to the various branches trying to update it. We looked at histories so at the artifact level, the document level, and the project level, and we established the concept of traceability tables and documents uh, in automatic linking. There's also manual forms of linking traceability. So I took that one out, sorry. Uh, this is an example of a lot of the customers that uh, we currently support. You'll see that we cover pretty much all, all types of uh, industries, all sizes of companies. It would fit in very nicely here. The next steps, maybe you wanted to try this yourself. You can download a free 30-day trial, or you can try it live on our website. Uh, if you're a little farther along in your decision process, you can request a proof of concept. So we can initiate that uh, either on in the cloud or, or at your site, your choice. 
You can also find various video demonstrations explaining different aspects of the Polarian products on our homepage, which is www.polarian.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and a few other media forums. Uh, if you have any questions uh, that we don't answer today, or if you, uh, for example, sometimes we get questions that says, can you run in the cloud? Well, absolutely. We can be hosted. We can host. We can uh, put, your, put our system directly into your environment. Any questions or comments or concerns that you may need uh, answered, you can reach me at uh, my name, Jim Valparanti, at Calarian.com. We will get back with you uh, as soon as we can, as soon as, well, as soon as possible. Again, thank you so much, and uh, we're kind of done with this aspect of, of the presentation, and we'll move into something more along the lines of Q&A. Nancy, do we have any outstanding questions? Yes, great presentation, Jim. I do have a few that have come in, so I'll present those to you. And a reminder to everyone else, if you have additional questions, please put them into the Q&A box, and I'll be able to present those to Jim. So the first question up is, how does Polarian link to other tasks or work items? Inside of Polarian, we saw one way where, where we have an automatic link where I could go to a work item. Uh, a work item could be a requirement, it could be a task, whatever. And I could say, hit that little blue plus sign, and it'll drop down a menu and it'll say, link a verifying test case, link a supporting task, link a, a refining requirement, whatever. And when I click on that, uh, that will go ahead and allow me to build that work item. Now, coming back the other way, once that's built, it will automatically be linked. Now, there is a manual form of linking that's very simple as well open up two documents, for example, one's requirements, one's tasks, to the immediate left side the doc of the icon identifying the work item, there's a little link. You click on one and a little window pops up, you put in a little bit of information, you click on the other one, and it creates the link manually. Now, one extension to this answer is that uh, the number of links, the number, the depth that you can link, I don't think that there's actually a limit. You can go two levels, like a test with supporting I'm sorry, a requirement with supporting test cases. Or you can go three levels where you have requirements with tasks with supporting test cases. Or you can mix and match that pretty much any way you want and go down four, five, six, seven levels. It's up to you. I have some more questions coming in. The next one, and we've touched on this a bit throughout about managing documents, but how does Polarian specifically manage documents, if you wanted to talk to that? I am going to go to the homepage here of the eLibrary demo. Now, how do we manage documents? Anywhere you see on the left side in this window where there's a blue icon, this is a document. So in, 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 in uh, relation to documents, this is also in an area, this is called specification. We have what we call spaces. So let me come down here and expand into spaces. We have spaces, we have check-in documents, commons, demonstration. Now these are, these are names that we have built. These are not names that you have to use for the FMEA risk, specification testing. These are organizational places. So if I were to go into the requirements area here for specifications and open it up, you'll see it's the same thing. It has the blue icons and the green icons. Blue icons are documents. So when we click on a blue icon, we open the document. Let me go ahead and close down this, this panel over here. We open the document and you get to see it and work with it like we did in the uh, in the presentation. You have in this example requirements. There's that link I was talking about just a moment ago, by the way. Uh, we, we have that and, and uh, the document itself is managed historically as we saw the revisions of a document and the pieces inside are managed individually in, in a history perspective. So I don't know if that answers the question. I hope so. We keep uh, you know, the documents are created inter internally. They're put into spaces for organization. We actually version them and, and manage them from that perspective. So they have revisions and just like a work item. Great, Jim. And the uh, the person that asked the question said that was perfect. It was bang on. The The next question we have is, can we create diagrams inside the RM tool? And are templates available? Is this, uh, uh, maybe while I'm talking, whoever submitted that question could uh, answer this for me real quick. When we're talking about templates, are we talking about templates of symbols for the diagram editor, or are we talking about templates for documents or projects? <clears throat> All three exist, by the way. All right, so let's take a look here. We've got a, we've got a uh, requirement here. I've clicked into it. 
Now, if I come up to the top here, the, the bar, and I click on this, I can see I have a diagram editor. I'm going to go ahead in there. Now, this diagram editor looks a lot like um, so many other ones on the market, like Visio, in fact. I think Visio set the standard, and everybody kind of used to that, so we kind of support that. Uh, we have general templates. We have, uh, let's come down here. We have general UML templates, flowcharting, basics, mockups. All these different template library or templates are in our library. So let me go ahead and give you an idea. Let's create a container and uh, we're going to put some things in it. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. We're going to go down to mockups. Hold on just a minute here. Let's go down. Let's find our mockups. Little charts. Oh, there was some. Okay, there's buttons, containers. All right, so let's build a screen with tabs. Just going to take that. And inside of that, we can put what do we have here? Option one. We'll put that here. We'll do it again so that we can create like a button list. We might have a drop down type of thing here, or titles. So I think you get the idea. So we have this built into the system. Now we can use this to build flowcharts or or any kind of process charts. We use them internally, quite honestly, to build our process charts when we're working with customers. So I'm going to say insert. So what's happening is that's come back and gone right into the requirement, okay, just exactly the way I have it now. If I say save, it becomes part of that requirement. When I look at the history, you'll see that this was added today by me. So the diagram editor exists. It can work in the uh, directly into the, uh, the requirement in a document, or let me go ahead and open this. The document is being open. I'm sorry, not the document, but the product is uh, the requirement is being open. As you can see, it's been added to this aspect of it as well. So you have uh, both both aspects in the document and in the work item itself. Okay, that was good. The uh, the response came back. Jim said, <clears throat> "Excuse me, I'm sorry. Looks good." Can I link a requirement to a diagram? In essence, we've done that because once this document, uh, once, you know, we're looking at the requirement here, and if I click on the picture, I can actually just go and edit it. Okay, now that is not a problem. So it's basically linked automatically. Now, if if what we're talking about is, can I have like a flow diagram with different blocks, like a flow chart or a process, and put a link in the item, like in this title block, can I link this in and of itself back to a requirement? That answer at this point is no, it's not possible. We are, however, looking into that and working, uh, working to try to make that happen because we do have, we do, we have had several requests for them. In Polarian, how are tasks assigned to create test cases or requirements? Okay, let's take a look at work items. Work items. In this particular project, I have business cases, user stories, requirements, tasks, test cases. These last several uh, exist so that we can look at these. Let's, uh, let's look at user stories. I have a user story. I'm going to pick on this one since it's, it's open. One of the things I can do is say, I wish to assign this to somebody. Let me assign this to uh, me. Or maybe I need to assign it to more than one person. Let me go ahead. Uh, my cohort here, Andy. All right, so when I save this, oops, sorry, wrong button. Edit, save, there we go. Andy and Jim will be notified that this has been, that this, that this user story has been assigned to them. And this will hold true for any, uh, any uh, work item that we have. Like this is a test case. Let's go look at this particular test case. It has assignees identified, they're not, not identified, but nonetheless they're here. So when I do this and save it, I will be notified, and using me as an example, but whoever I assign this to will be notified that this test case has been assigned to them for them to work on. Okay, I don't have any uh, additional questions right now in the Q&A box. I will leave it open for a few minutes longer and just close out with a, with a thank you um, to our presenter, Jim, today. And for all of our attendees, thank you very much for your time and spending it with us today. Following the webinar, as I alluded to earlier, you will receive the audio, you'll receive a survey. As well, the webinar will become on demand early next week, so we hope that you will share that uh, with your colleagues. And remember to subscribe to the Polarium blog. We have some great articles coming out, 
and we have some special summer activities happening that will be promoted within our blog as well. So again, on behalf of Polarian Software, thank you for sharing your time with us today. And we'll leave the Q&A box open just for a few minutes longer in case someone does have a question. Thanks very much.